I'm here at the entrance to the magnificent stately home of Wentworth Woodhouse in Rotherham, Yorkshire's best kept secret. Here, the seventh Earl Billy Fitzwilliam and his wife Countess Maud entertained family, friends, guests, and royalty in these awe inspiring state rooms. The staff who worked behind the scenes were highly skilled and incredibly hard working. In 1911, just 34 live-in staff managed this vast house. Today, we're going to look at the life story of just one of them. Oscar John Snelling was born in Crawley, Ilford, Sussex, in 1889. In June 1908, aged 19, he joined the Wentworth staff as third footman. Three years later, he'd risen to the position of second footman. The staff were all single and recruited from all over Britain and France. Oscar was known at Wentworth as John. Footmen often inherited more than just their livery from their predecessors. He would have shared a bedroom here, below ground level with Edwin Browning, the third footman. John would have had his meals here in the servants' hall, where the servants' bells ensured they were always on call. By seven in the morning, John would have been up and delivering tea trays outside the family's bedrooms for the ladies' maids and the valet to take in. Have a heart, Miss Simpson. This is my fifth train. His lordship and his guests want to make an early start this morning. Well, knowing you, you won't have hurried. As Mr. Bowler, our esteemed groom of chamber, would say, it's not a footman's job to be seen hurrying around anywhere. Stand tall, John, and pace for dignity. You are representing the honour and dignity of Wentworth House. Well, the honour and dignity of Wentworth House. Better get a hurry on, or he'll be in hot water. His three-day rotation of duties would have included a day spent close waiting, a duty that involved a lot of standing around waiting to be summoned by the Earl or Countess to serve refreshments, run errands or deliver messages. He would also have helped serve meals on important occasions. The following day, he might be expected to escort the family out. We know in 1911, he was reimbursed seven shillings for a pair of carriage gloves. The next day would involve normal backstage activities, such as helping to valet one of the gentlemen or cleaning the silver. And see, and I'm parched. Which look at my blisters, and I've only just started this morning. Ugh, your hands are too soft, John. <laughs> you want to talk about blisters? Try working in the kitchens. Ever since our chef, the man Stiller La Roche, left us in the village, I've been working flat out. Talking witch. Although other staff considered footmen largely decorative, when guests arrived, John would have been expected to pitch in and help carry guests' trunks and baggage up from the pillared hall to the bedrooms, sometimes up several flights of stairs or into the distant guest swings. Since 
Once up to five changes of clothing a day were required by guests at the Fitzwilliams country house parties. This was back-breaking work. John was here at Wentworth at Easter 1910 to witness an extraordinary aviation event. The flight of one of the earliest ever successful aeroplanes from the lawns of Wentworth Woodhouse itself. The whole country had been aeroplane crazy since the very first aviation competition in Britain had been held in Doncaster the previous year. The Earl dreamed of building them and the Countess dreamed of flying in them. The aircraft the Earl chose was a Blériot, the same type that had just eight months before made an unbelievable record-breaking first flight across the Channel. When the Earl's Blériot arrived, the people of Wentworth and the surrounding areas flocked into the park to watch. John was among them. Blimey, Miss Simpson, you should have seen it. My lady's hat got sadly crushed, so by the time I'd rescued all the ostrich feathers, I'd missed most of it. Well, the aeroplane arrived in a big box towed by a motor car, and Mr Richardson from Simplex, and his men put it together. It took a couple of hours. Then they had to wait till the wind to drop. If there had been enough wind to bend a blade of grass, they wouldn't have tried it. Then Mr Richardson took off. He shot forward and up. As I live and breathe, it was flying in the air, Miss Simpson. It went up 15 feet for about 100 yards. It came down again quick though, didn't it? Well, it was the first attempt. I'll admit, they burst a tyre coming down, but that was just unlucky. Once I found an old motorcycle wheel to replace it, they had another six goes. That was the last one. I wish I'd seen it. I heard a ladyship sat in it. I heard Mr Richardson say landing would be as easy as falling off a log. Well, it was. They made a right mess of that plane. All crunched up at the front, it was. Give over, Nancy. You don't know anything about it. What we saw today was a birth of a new age. Mark my words. They'll be flying to the moon in our lifetime, you'll see. John left Wentworth in April 1912 to become a market gardener, going into business with Nance's father. And he and Nance married two years later, with war clouds on the horizon. By 1915, they had a six-month-old son, and conscription was just around the corner. He volunteered with the Royal Flying Corps at Farnborough, with his older brother Ralph, head butler at Reddisham Hall, and Edwin Browning, once the third footman at Wentworth Woodhouse. If he dreamed of being a knight of the air, he was sadly disappointed. Within three weeks, he was out in France on the Western Front, assigned as an air mechanic to the number three kite section. The kite balloons provided airborne observation posts and each was looked after by a 48-man team, of which John was part. The balloons were filled with highly flammable hydrogen and because they provided the users with strategic advantage, they were key targets for enemy fire. Being under a kite balloon was a completely terrifying experience. John would have been dodging aircraft bombs, artillery fire and, on a daily basis, flaming debris as the balloons were shot out of the skies. In 1918, John became a motorcycle dispatch rider, carrying information and orders for the British Expeditionary Force in both Belgium and France. When he was demobbed in 1920, he returned to his family in Chichester and worked as a lorry driver. When World War II broke out in 1939, aged 50, John re-enlisted as aircraftsman second class for the duration of the war. Remarkably, Oscar John Snelling, who had seen the birth of a new age in 1910, when he and Nance watched the Earl's Blériot fly over Wentworth Woodhouse, lived long enough to see in 1969 Apollo 11 take off and a man walk on the moon. His great-grandson remembers him fondly as a wonderful man. 
John died on the 19th of April, 1987, aged 98. If you have a story about a family member who worked at Wentworth Woodhouse to share with us, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next time as we look at the youngest and most junior of the male live-in staff, the steward's room boy, who in 1911 had just joined the staff as a trainee footman.